So this is one of our first uh, this semester uh, to bring work from the collection, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Photography. Those of you who don't know the museum, it's two doors down uh, at 600 South Michigan. Uh, we have a collection of about 12,000 photographs um, from about, I would say, around 1,500 um, artists uh, and, and growing. Uh, so I encourage each of you to attend um, a new museum events as well. And in our collection, we have um, hundreds um, that we are thrilled to um, have of David Plowden's work over the years. So this, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, today with David, who I've shown his work in uh, numerous exhibitions. I have a little bit of a, an interest in infrastructure, which people think is boring, but David and I uh, share that interest. <laughs> so, so David um, um, has, I think as many people know, has photographed um, industry, has photographed bridges, uh, uh, railroads, uh, trains, this fascination with trains. Um, and one of the things that this uh, book uh, today, we're, we're here uh, for the um, so the, the book release of Heartland, his newest publication. Uh, so we're thrilled to have works from that publication. And we're going to discuss uh, th this work in particular tonight, uh, but I'm sure it will touch on many of uh, his works, even though there's not so many bridges in this exhibition as I've shown in my previous exhibition. <laughs> there are more grain elevators in Prairie. So, um, I would like to begin the discussion um, by asking um, David to sort of bring us to, uh, take us to where you first experienced the prairie, the heartland, and knowing you're coming from the East Coast, what that, what brought you to the heartland, what kept you in the heartland, and what were your impressions of the heartland? Well, you know, I, uh I do come from East, I come from New York and Vermont. And if you can imagine more different places than the Middle West and Vermont and New York, which is completely, absolutely impossible to see the sky. And in Vermont, we had a farm where there was a beautiful, wonderful hill of maples behind the farm. But the sun went down about five o'clock in the afternoon in the summer. One of the things I always felt living in New York and in Vermont was claustrophobic. You could never see the sky. In New York, my bedroom as a little boy at the lookout and a little tiny patch of sky. I also had an apartment where the only light we had was reflected off the windows of the building on the north side. So, I mean, this was. And then in Vermont, the same thing, everything's very close. So I yearned for space. In fact, at one point, my family decided that I should go to art school. Right. So I went, and they had a nice big piece of paper on the newsprint. And I drew a little train, a little town, a little grove of trees, all on the bottom of the page, and left the entire rest of the page of yearning for space, obviously. So the art student, the teacher said, he has to fill the page. So they took me out of the school. <laughs> All right, but I, this yearning, I went, it was the railroad who brought me out here in 19, July 1951. I took a train west from Chicago, and somewhere west of the cow, I noticed the landscape changed very drastically. And we've got to Ireland, in the middle of Ireland, on Ames, this, this, this totally, totally different place in 
anything I've ever seen. You can see the sky. And I spent the night in Omaha, and the next morning I was going to ride the train to San Francisco. But there was a mail train next to the Overland Limited. The conductor of the mail train was down there on the platform, and I told him it was my first trip west. And he said, Ride with us. We'll show you what it's like. You can stand on the back platform all the way from here to Cheyenne if you want. So I gave up my trip on the Overland Limited, and I went on this long mail train with one rider coach at the back of it, and the crew, the only people on the train, except for me. And I did stand on the back platform, and I watched Nebraska unfold behind the train, searching out to infinity, one train elevator after another, every six miles. And I was absolutely rolled over by the space, and by the beauty of this landscape, which was so wide and so pure, and so different from anything I knew. And then I went to work for the railroad, in 1956, 55, after I went to Yale. And one thing I remember about there was I went one day on a local train, we went out this, on a little branch line out into South Dakota. And I got off the train and I walked out into a field, probably on the section of the road. And all of a sudden, I realized the world was turning to one of the flattest places on earth. There was nothing. Hold on to. And I think I realized that this country out here is under the sky completely. And this was an experience that I had absolutely never had before. I never got over it. I quit the railroad when I was promoted and they wanted to take an office on that one. But I very soon decided to come back. Instructor photographs. Um, I wanted to read a, a very short quote um, that you include in your essay in The Heartland Book that everyone can buy tonight. Somebody has read something. Don't do this. No, not even your, it's, it's a quote. It's, a quote, it's right. not you. Um, it's not anyways, it's written. about, it's when, which I, it struck me when I read this um, very much about the prairie, and I know that. This uh, <coughs> rings true for you of your experience. Um, uh, so it's a, it's written by Robert Louis Stevenson when he was exp going across on train through Nebraska in 1880. He writes, "We were at sea. There is no other adequate expression. It was a world almost without a feature, an empty sky, an empty earth, front and back, the line." of the railway stretched from horizon to horizon like a queue across a bill billiard board. On either hand, the green plains ran till it touched the skirts of heaven. So can you talk a little bit about that feeling um, about being at sea? Yes, I mean, you really are. And you really sense that when you go way west, when you run up against the coastline of the Rockies, as you are when you're in Kansas. And there's a place actually called First View, about 68 miles east of Denver, where you have been at sea for days and days and days. And I, you know, I think it's all the people who go across the country, wagons, wagon trains, they must like to see something, this line, this coastline. And it is on the coastline, because you do see first the line of clouds very often. And then all of a sudden, you see this line. You realize that maybe, I mean, for me, I spent so many years traveling back and forth across this country. I would have been out there maybe for a month photographing, and all of a sudden you see this coastline. And when you climb up, and the train actually climbs up out of Denver, it goes all the side of the mountain. And just before it turns into the mountain, it's a place called Plainview. And you turn and you look, and here's what Jesus said. Because when you're up there, you suddenly look out across this expanse, which stretches as far as you can see from eye to eye. It's just unbelievable, rising to the horizon. You can almost imagine that you see the curvature of the earth. Maybe you do. But there is nothing else. <coughs> nothing. And to me, this 
it is it, it is like being, it is as massive as the sea. And it's, it's, you know, probably an enormous part of this continent. And it's breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. And probably the hardest thing I've ever tried to photograph. Mm. But you've made breathtaking that. photographs. Well, yeah, so, so. <laughs> well, we're surrounded by them. Yeah. It's nice that you put them out. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, we go from the the horizon, the prairie here, moving towards a little bit more of the industry there. Maybe we could talk a little bit about um, the, the the grain elevators oh, and what 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 draws you to these. Uh, so-called prairie cathedrals. Well, they, they are in a way, and if you look at them from a distance, you realize that each town, where it may be nothing but just a dusty main street, has its own skyscraper. It's marked by the grain elevator, and they're really not. I don't know whether you can call them whether you call them straight architecture or not. They're really engineering. Heaps. Wonderful, Corbusier, of course, wrote the, the first fruits of the new age. He admired the engineering calling of these buildings, just the way I admire bridges. They're not trying to be anything but what they are. They're grain bins, they're whole grain, which of course is iconic because it is there in the middle of the grain area. So there's a real purpose to them. And to me, they are obviously the the most important architectural, if you will, thing on the landscape. I mean, in Vermont, we don't have grain elevators. We have dairy barns, not so many anymore, and we have congregational churches in town. But out here, the grain elevator. And I heard of, there was a, a place called Dyson, Iowa. And I was photographing the main street. It's the grain elevator I was photographing on the main street. The fellow comes up to me and he says, why are you photographing that? Well, you might ask that. Here I am in the middle of Main Street. It's in the evening, the light's just beautiful. And here I am, my camera, going to rain over here. Well, I said, it's, it's the most important building in town, isn't it? I mean, just look at it. Oh, well, it's everything else. And I said, it's also probably the center of the commerce of the town, isn't it? Do you deal here? Do you sell your grain here? Yeah. And he looked at me, he looked at me, he kept looking at me, he was a little bit close to my daughter. Then he looked at the grain elevator again. And he said, you know, I'll never look at it the same way. And you know, just the very fact of being there with the camera so many times has made people say the same thing. I'll never look at that again the same way. And this, I think, is one of the one of the things about making photographs is that you want people to look at things that they perhaps they perhaps they don't look at. Uh, many of us do take look at the flatlands of the Middle East and I mean, they're sort of you have the I eighty syndrome where we say, when are we gonna get there? <laughs> uh, you know, gasping for breath I've got to get out of this place, get across this land. <clears throat> If you turn off the interstate and drive the section roads, you'll be very surprised. I don't tell you what we do out here, but it's like but it's a treasure trove of magnificent things. Something will do with the fuel and wheat. Even in the summer, a soybean field. I kept thinking to myself, how am I going to photograph soybeans? Beans. Right? Well, go out with the soybeans that are in full leaf in July or August. On a day when there's a slight breeze and they're rippling, as if it were late, there's great beauty in these crops. And in the spring, everything is just coming up, these roads, these wind roads are getting, they make the most beautiful patterns. And everything depends, I think, on the patterns on the land. Talk about the sky a little bit, but before that, I 
talking about the road and I-80 and getting off the road. Can you mm -hmm. discuss a little bit of your photographic strategies, uh, both both um, how, how long do you go out on the road to photograph? How long does it take? How do you know you've got the photograph? When can you pack up your car and keep going? So get a little bit of like, give us a little inside knowledge on how you approach a picture. It's, as I said, it's the most difficult landscape. It's difficult to advertise it because it's entirely dependent on light and shadow. I mean, all photographs are. But most here, because you have a flat plane, so the clouds, which are casting shadows on the landscape, give it the depth. You have these rows, these wind rows of things, props which give it, again, a sense of perspective. But the hardest thing, I think, of all, is to try to get, essentially, a two-dimensional landscape and give it first dimension, and that you give it depth, to give it perspective. So you always have to have something in the foreground and something there in the background to draw you through it. And if it doesn't, you can drive all day long I think that I said, I drive within miles upon miles upon miles and never found anything. Because everything has to come together to make the photograph. I mean, everything is absolutely beautiful. But then, all of a sudden, the light will change. And what was there a few minutes before is a beautiful rain over here with a light on it. It's suddenly flat and dead. You drive along and you think, oh, this is a perfect spot. And you get out and you look at it, and there's some little a bush in the way that you can't cut down, or you can't remove. It's in the way, or a telephone pole. Use the telephone poles, because they're actually a wonderful way of giving perspective along the telephone poles, or a telephone pole at a barn in the distance. You've created an absolutely flat landscape. You've created perspective. Of course, the camera doesn't have a perspective, it has one eye. So we're always having to outlive that anyway. But out there, I think, you know, one of the most simple things is the fact that you, you say to yourself, I'm going to go out and I'm going to photograph the heartland. I'm, I'm out here, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the middle of it. And you see this landscape, you see this wonderful landscape building up in front of you, and you say to yourself, I there must be something to use the light for. Something has to come together. A crossroad, railroad track, and a section road. Something that you can use the gravel, for instance, on a section road. Those wonderful things to give perspective. When the light is low in the day, breaking across. It. One of the most important parts of the photographs out here is how the light is it's an absolutely dead, flat day. Right, emphasize the emptiness of the land out here because it's lonely and it's very empty. But you can also, in the evening, when the light is low and raking across these things, it gives pebbles on the road death. Moreover, I find in the evening I follow the light because it's it's, it's waning, it's disappearing. So if you follow the light and you see more and more and more into the depths of things. I have to confess I don't like the morning. It's an injection. The light, oh, whoa, you know, please go away. Too bright. Except on foggy mornings, and that's very different. It's a whole other thing. But to me, it's the, it's the magic of the evening when I would take most of my photographs, if I had a chance. Or before and after a storm. Mm. And that's very much part of this land. It really is the floor of the sky. And I did a book called The Floor of the Sky, far in from the couch, and her frame. And it is indeed, we are totally dependent. Anyone lived out here is totally dependent on the sky. And it really 
puts us in a very cosmic perspective. I mean, despite the fact that we have all this machinery and all these chemicals and all of this stuff that's transformed the landscape, we're still that tiny little thing living on the interface of the heavens. And we are totally dependent on what happens in the sky, as we know. As we know, yeah. I mean, I think um, in light of the most recent storms yes. uh, that uh, devastated uh, much of central... Yes, and lots of places that I photographed. Lots of places uh, have, have, been, been, have been, been destroyed. Um, you can talk about you had um, that experience of uh, photographing <laughs> Close, too close to the perfect storm, over, perhaps. Over stage uh, by stage, yes. <laughs> I have, and I have been caught on several occasions in where I had to actually take shelter in the grain elevator. And because the light before a tornado is just incredible, the intensity of the light, the intensity of the sky, I can tell you it's absolutely beyond belief. But you. <laughs> You don't want to stay too long in the center of our in Kansas a couple of summers ago. And we were photographing, and there was an incredible storm blowing up. And at one point, Sandy said, look at that beautiful white road leading right in the dark sky. And I said, no way, I'll be going up there. Another time, we were, I were out where a storm was blowing up, and it was just beautiful. And I said to her, I said, we're going to the moment you see a crack of lightning anywhere out there, we're out of here. We saw it, and we got in the car and bolted, and mm -hmm. my God, the oil was, came quickly rather than driving on the gravel road. And by the time we hit the oil, the, the car road, it was a howling wind. And indeed, we ran ahead of it, got away from it, which is, I mean, you really, it catches up with you it catches up with you so quickly that you don't realize it. And driving west one day to Iowa, I was going on uh, what is it, the tri-state where it is, the, the, the I-88 towards west. And I, I saw this, suddenly this black storm, a cloud that did a little bit, so sky. So I called a friend of mine in Iowa and I said, what's going on in Iowa City? He said, get off the road quickly. He said, we heard nothing but tornado warnings all day. Mm -hmm. So I did find, finally, I got across and went to a place with a truck stop. No, it was a, no, it was not, not a truck stop, it was a place beside the road, rest stop. And pulled off and we listened to the radio and suddenly the radio tower went down and the wind started to blow and everything. And I suddenly realized there's a basement here. And luckily it was flat, it was not glass, it was plastic. And the wind howled, the wind howled. I parked my car right up against the semi. I suppose I get to it, thinking like a windbreak. And it howled, and the storm passed over. And there was an old trucker who was there. And he and I, everything else left, it was, began to let up, and he and I stayed. Because, as you know, the tornadoes are open at the back end of the storm. I mean to that. Well, we got finally got out and drove west, and there were pickup trucks that had been semis that had been turned over. Oh. An entire field of corn had been cut to ribbons. There were fields full of water. I did stop at a truck stop, and there was a man in there that had a load of boats. And he said, I'm just going to stay here and sell them. <laughs> <laughs> Everything had been flooded. But it just shows you, I mean, I had it, this all came up within a matter of 40 minutes. And it lasted maybe, I don't know, a minute. It comes up very fast, and it's terrifying. And I've camped out there for years and years and years, not because I did it for pleasure, but because it made the money go further. And many a night we had to pick up and run and go and find some place like a substantial bill the same. You're always on the TV out there. 
But I think we all live under the, live under the weather. And I, when we were out there last time, the big storm I was photographing, and I was in touch with the man at the Kansas Wheat uh, Exchange Authority Association. And we called every day on cell phone. Where's the best wheat? Where's this? Where's the harvest happening? Every day, we called twice a day on, on a cell phone. And I called him one morning. I said, Bill, I said I photographed a really bad storm last night. He said, yes, I know. It took out a section of my wheat. So it's, it's you really is, it's, it's, it's a scary country. But it's so beautiful. And people, when I first came out here, I couldn't believe the people actually lived. <laughs> We're all here. <laughs> but it is so beautiful. It is so incredibly beautiful. Beauty. Um, you know, many of your books, um, I think you've published, I don't know, are you at 24? 20? No, 20? 22. 22 books. <laughs> the second book. Uh, uh, many of the books we have displayed um, in the bookcase uh, just around the corner there. Um, many of your books uh, tend to be more about change. And, and loss. Um, this book uh, seems to be much more about the celebration, the celebration of the heartland. Um, uh, can you can you talk about that uh, in the form of uh, of deciding to make this a a book that is a little bit of a different style, and then also if you could maybe take us through. Um, the editing process, um, the, the how you how you move us, the viewer, through your book mm. to to show that sort of celebration. You know, how, how do you through editing? How, what was your strategy? Where to start with the editing? Of the <laughs> Interesting questions. Yes, it is a celebration. Yes, I have spent my life photographing things. I have photographed change. I photographed things that are disappearing. I photograph our culture, which has changed so much. I started photographing the Grupo C locomotive because I loved the locomotive and realized it was going. That's how I started to photograph. Just the train. Because they were disappearing, because they were going to go. And I spent a career photographing things. I had an awful phrase that I used once. I was one step ahead of the wrecking ball. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems true. Well, a couple of things. One, there's not much left of the kinds of things that I started out to photograph. They're almost all gone. Look at main streets and small towns, for an example. They don't exist, really, the way they did when I started out. But also, at my age, I keep thinking to myself, you know, I celebrate the fact that I'm still alive. And I thought, how do I essentially photograph the joy of being alive? And the joy of finding something, I guess I wanted to find something that was intensely beautiful, something that I love, to express that. And because I had fallen in love with this country out here years ago, what better place to celebrate? You know, it's not been photographed that much. It's one of the unsung parts of the country. I get this such a large part of it. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm always photographing things which are, which are forgotten, unsung. And I'm not saying the people who live out here don't be told it isn't. On the side. I mean, it's beautiful. But the people like my English cousins who would come to America and fly to Boston, fly to Washington, and fly to New York and San Francisco, fly home over the pole, and write us a letter a few days later saying how nice it was to see America. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, I thought to myself, all right, I really want to photograph something that is about America, that, is, that, is, that shows the very beauty of the land. And there's something about being out here where you 
land takes on another meaning. We talk about my country, we talk about our land in a very abstract sense. But when you hear on the land, and dealing with the land, it takes on a very different characteristic. And for me, I wanted to photograph the sense of land. I wanted to photograph, because to me, that's the essence of, of the country. And because of the fact that it hadn't been done so much, I think, you know, the mountains have been done, the sea coast have been done. Here's a part of the world that I really love. So make love to it. Go out and photograph it with the same passion and adoration that you did your locomotives and you did your main streets. So I think you really have to love something in order to photograph it properly. Mm -hmm. Everybody's saying, watch us in that country. Forgetting what the word means. So I'm an amateur because I love doing what I do. And to me, going out there, the challenge is always a very important part of it. I mean, this is a very challenging landscape for many, many reasons we've talked about. And so the combination of having a challenge, which I always need, combination of photographing something that I love, and saying to myself, yes, we, John Deere, and Case, and Montenegro, and all these people who changed the character, you know, the prairie isn't the same as it used to be. It's gone, small farms are gone. But the intrinsic sense of land is still there. It's still wide open. It's still beautiful. And I guess that's really what I wanted to set out to do with this book, is to photograph something I love. And I thought, you know, the main streets are gone, the local winters are gone, all the things that I had loved so dearly weren't there. But the one place that was was this country out here. And it was the one place that I had never really photographed. I'd done a book called Throw in the Sky, which was a disaster. Because it was about putting it together. This was half color and half black and white. And the designer said, we're only going to use three shapes. But it actually killed the book, because you can't arbitrarily go out and say, this is going to be in color, and this is going to be in black and white. In the first place, I'm not a color photographer. I'm absolutely colorblind when I'm photographing. I don't see color at all. So here we have the black and white photographs of this landscape. And here we're trying to put this in the book. Well, the first publisher I worked with years and years ago used to talk about choreography. He had a whole host of designers working for him. But after they all gone home, he would take all their work and redesign it. And he always said, this isn't choreographed. He said, look, it's boring. But he said, we have to have a flow. We have to have, a flow. We have, to have time to relax and time to hear the great sound orchestra. And that, you know, in a way out here, that's what you listen to. But you also have to have things just so people will look carefully. And so we are putting together a book. You always have to find a way of seducing the reader or the, or the person that's looking at it. Get him interested or her interested. Once you have, then you can bring in the details. Once having established the fact, ah, I'll never see that great be the same way again. Once you've made some way, some way of getting that person in there. And I think one of the ways to do it is to use the foreground, to give your viewer a place to stand. And of course, out here, there's plenty of land to stand on. But I think when you're dealing with this out here, to try and make it interesting. Over and over again, driving 200 miles a day from the same countryside looks, begins to look the same. It really does. I mean, sometimes I suffer from the I-80 syndrome. You know, give me something different. Find something different. So when you're putting a book together, I think my editor, Jim Mars at Norton, first thing he said was, these pictures are going to be one to a page. The spread, the spread, because we don't want them competing with each other. There are two; they should be looked at separately. 
so each one can speak for itself. But it's not like an exhibition, it's not three dimensional. You don't walk into it, you look at it. So you have to turn the page, and the idea is to keep a, new, a surprise, a new thing on every page in some way, so that you want to turn the page again. And I find, I find, well, we were doing this book, Sam and I to take these photographs and throw them out on the living floor, as we have with so many books, and go over them, spread them out. I can't do it on the computer. I have to see the actual photograph on the floor and move it around and go away from it. Leave it, oh, the dog doesn't roll over it. Leave them <laughs> on the floor. Look at them and come back to them and see what pictures go together and what don't. And there's so many pictures that are perfectly decent photographs which don't go together in this sequence, and they put aside. You, know, you can't build a paragraph around one word. You can't build a sequence in a book around one photograph. They all have to, in one way or another, I think, lead to the other. One has to lead. You know, so many so-called favorite photographs don't get used. I mean, I can put together a book of discards of photographs that I love, but there was never a place to use them in the choreography. And you have to be very strict. You have to be really awfully strict. And I'm my own words critic. And so you really just have to say, okay, does it work? Does it go together or not? And in this case, dealing with the same landscape, flat landscape, well, I mean, look, it's an atmosphere of the mountains, for God's sake, all right? And so I figured, well, all right, I can deal with planes. And my secret is not, and it, the fruit is in the eating, it's in the pudding, whether, whether anybody likes the book or not, whether it works. And it's new. It's very hard. It's, every book is very is very hard. Every book has its own way of, of telling you essentially how it wants to be, how it wants to be. It's amazing how the photographs will tell you how to put them together. And when laying out a book, I will very often take typewriting paper, three and a half eleven sheets of paper, and be laying the thing out and realize there's a gap. There's a place here. We don't have the photograph. We don't have anything that's going to fit in that space, so you put a white piece of paper there. Sometimes in the book, that becomes a white piece of paper. All right? In this case, there were lots of them. In other cases, it means, okay, pardon, find the picture that goes there or take the other ones out. And it's a fascinating, I've been doing this for many years, and that's the fascinating procedure, it really is. And it is, well, it, it, it's not a matter of just throwing the pictures on the floor. It's a matter of organizing them. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a gamble. The whole thing is a gamble. The whole bunch of charges is a gamble. It's magic. I mean, I, it really is. It's absolute magic that, <laughs> that, a, that a photograph materializes. I mean, I will know this is a landscape that I need to photograph, but I have a clue what photograph I'm going to make until I find it. You know, Robert Flatter is a great filmmaker. He was a great friend of my father. I remember as a little boy going to the house, and these people were all talking to him, was quite small. But I remember him once hearing him say, You cannot preconceive the film, you can't preconceive the photograph. Wonderful advice. I mean, I told you to somebody else, and I listened to it. I that's why I wanted it. You have no idea what the photograph is going to be until you actually find it. And it is a matter of finding it. And as I said, it's, it's automatic. And then, <laughs> once you have it, you have a little box somehow, a film. Because I have to confess, I haven't tried the digital yet. It's on there as a latent image in the box on the film. Then it's up to you to bring it out in the dark or on the printer or whatever. And that's another form of magic. 
made is of actually bringing out what you saw in the field and putting it on the paper. And to me, the reality is the photograph. Because what's out there may be real out there. But what I have interpreted, and what I have brought here on the wall here, these are the reality. You know, I was even there about something. Do you know what I mean? I think all good magic comes from good magicians. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're already decided that. Um, I, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to see if there was anyone who wanted uh, to ask any questions. Um, David, while well, we have him here, this is a great opportunity. Well, I have digital cameras, and I was going to use digital cameras, but unfortunately, circumstances got in the way. I still have them, all set up. In fact, Glenn uh, and Andrew over there helped me. So and Cannon came up and helped me. All these we came out, and we had, we went through all of the things that we did. We all set the ground the field. And we went with circumstances after another. So this is one day after another, no matter where going. So yes, I've taken a few cameras, two pictures, one of Sandra, one of Glenn, one of me. We've done a lot of tests, a massive number of tests of different lenses, different cameras, different Canon cameras. And I have all this equipment. I have everything, everything ready to go. But everything I have, everything is here, is captured on film. And I spend the time have a chance to go out and photograph. And I'm scared to death because I have no idea how it's going to work. Remember, I use a hustle and a square. So, this will have a square. So I'm worried about that a little bit, quite a bit. Right now, I'm scanning film. And I'm making only all of these pictures are from film. And they're all scanned in Photoshop. I'm going to have some 3880 printers. I've already worn one out. I think this one's what it sounds like. And I print. I scan and I print and I spend most of the day, most of my day doing it. But I haven't tried to do it yet. All right, you're okay. Well, I, I feel I should because I'll run out of the things that are worth, worth scanning. There are 15 miles of film to go through. 99% of it is, is worth looking at, but it's a hell of a lot of stuff to go through, so I'm having to keep it busy for a while. And I find all kinds of things that did work in the book, which are perfectly good, and that's a great excitement. So I think, oh, this has never been printed, this has never been seen. None of these photographs here were ever seen until this book came. It was all brand new stuff. Some of it's done in well, it's 86 over there, but most of it's most of it's done in the last in this century, the last 10 years. <laughs> but it's an interesting question. I used to I used to make my own chemicals. I studied with Minor White. And of course he he made the beer developer. We all made beer developers. Over years and years and years. And I suddenly I began to realize, oh my God, the other things are pretty really good. Here they are. I mix the developer different dilution. As Glenn would say, he was working for so many years in the dark room. Instead of using a variable contrast paper, use a variable contrast canopy. Use number three paper for years and years and years. Great three. Different emotions, because every emotion is different, obviously. And so some of the emotion is closer to four, or some is closer to two. So I would test maybe three or four different emotions of grade three, and then test them with different dilutions of developer. So that was my customized developer. But I used these at these states for year and year. Year and year. Have you tested all the others? And Dexol, 
Base. One to two or one to eight? Or one to one and a quarter, depending on the negative. So, and then, of course, it was the agitation. Mm -hmm. How much agitation are you going to do it? And then, in the end, up onto a plastic piece of plexiglass, and I have little bottles, little cans of hot water and hot developer and cotton in each one. Well, obviously, it's time for temperature, so we think the corner of the picture wasn't coming out. Grab hot water, squeeze it out, and just before a couple of times up there, and then throw it into the sauce. Yes, so the, it was very customized, but with standard chemicals. Stop using the making my own things all the time. Too much time. Miner always said, take the best negative you get the best negative you had so you don't have to spend so much time in the dark room. Spend your time in the field. And he was so right. He was. Usually in context, usually people working in the engine rooms or in steel mills or on the farm. I don't if they're working on something, I will have them actually at work in one way or another involved in their environment, what they're doing in that space. But if I want to photograph a person, I will make a photo. And in some cases, I would get to know people. When I was doing one of these books that took place maybe three or four years to put it together, and there were lots of people in it. There were lots of portraits. And I would feel I'd have to get to know the person well enough to ask them if I could take his or her portrait, because it's a dialogue. And yes, I do take portraits, believe it or not. And I have a vast collection of portraits, many of which have never been published. But if they have been published, they've been published in a context. On the boats, on the railroads, shopkeepers, farmers, people in their houses. Barbers and, and or people in their living room. And I, it's something that I am actually working on is putting together a group of portraits because I feel it would be very nice to separate people and have people look at the actors as, as individuals rather than being part of the land, part of what they're doing. So I, I, so I, am, I am not known for it, so I have this great humor. Treasure trove of, I think, of portraits, which I would love to put together someday. It's a project. Because hmm. gallery spaces and exhibition spaces are always different. Yes, they are. And I never hang my own exhibits. I always met the person who is the curator, the person who has like here, you can't vote. I don't want to have anything to do with you know the space, you know what goes best together on the walls. Mm. And you're walking into a room to look at the photographs. It's a three-dimensional experience. Mm. It's very, very different putting together a book, which is essentially one after another at a time, a spread at a time. Here you have a whole room to look at. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely different art. And I promise you, I don't really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be able to do it. I've had several exhibitions lately. Uh, I've told the person, oh, Natasha, <laughs> you'll hang on. You know, that's all we get to say. If you take charge, you know, that is your, it's your responsibility. I've, Told people in several museums that I think that I don't know. I please, you hang in this your space. And I have experts that travel around Iowa at the moment. Mm. And it's been in quite a few places. And I've gone to each place to give a talk. And it's fascinating to see how differently the same photographs are used in different spaces. And it's really very important. Do I stand up? I can't see you. Oh my god. <laughs>
this is so embarrassing. Um, I have somewhat of a different type of question. I'm wondering at what point your self-concept incorporated the identity of a photographer. So at what point did you identify yourself as a photographer? I see here you took your first photograph at age 11, and I'm wondering, was that a seminal moment, or was it later on? Mm. Good point. Yeah, I guess it was a seminal moment, because I wanted desperately to capture the locomotive. And that set in motion this whole thing of going out and capturing things. So maybe it wasn't 11, because I never, I did all kinds of things before I finally decided the hell with everything else, I want to be a photographer. That was in 1958. And at that point, I realized that this was something I had to do. But guess what I did? I photographed steam engine. Starting my career with a man who did not even photograph steam engine, Winston Lane, who was his assistant. And when I went into the field for the first time, it was to go and capture the end of the steam locomotives on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Railway. Again, that similar moment back when I was 11, when I was, oh God, when was I in 1926? I went to, for, to finish what I had started, and one thing led to another. I've never really thought of myself. I've thought about what I've been photographing. So I, it's, I'm the, the scribe. And yet, I'm very, I'm very particular about composition. I mean, I'm called a formalist. I thought that was an insult, but I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I haven't called it. And I really, I, first, when I first heard this, I thought, oh my God, it's too stiff, and rigid, and whatever. No, it's not. I have to see things that way. I always have been very careful. So defining myself as a photographer hard to do because I define myself by what I see. I don't think I'm asking your question. Well, that was wonderfully close. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> very good question. Yes. Hey, oh my gosh, how are you? <laughs> so here's my question. You always said never waste the light. Oh my great God. book. And so I want to ask a question. Give us an anecdote of a time when the light was perfect, but you didn't have a subject to shoot, and you actually were able to find one. Can you remember? Can you think of an anecdote where the light and the subject had to come together a, to split? I have a feeling you remember a specific photograph. No, 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 no. Well, I, I remember a few, but I think you'll probably remember oh. Well, I mean, there are places where you simply can't use the light. You're stuck in traffic on the damn run, okay? And you can't do a damn thing. Yes, you can. <laughs> well, I mean, all right. But then I'll put it, yes, I know you do. You've been to the most extraordinary places of any man I know. And you, yes, you could use the light on the damn ride or anywhere else. Right. And you have. All right? Take the New, take the, uh, New Jersey Turnpike. When it goes over the meadows, all right? It's on a, it's on a skyway. Traffic's moving 100 miles an hour, not really, going very fast. I see the most beautiful skyline in New York over the Jersey Meadows. You know, that. The light's perfect. It's 6 o'clock in the evening, July the 10th. What could be better? All right. How do I stop the car and get out without getting killed? <laughs> you pretend you have engine trouble. <laughs> And I have done it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, there are places where you have to work. You know the light is beautiful. All right, you're out here, and there's section roads. You're going east, west, north, south. So if you see this light, and you're going north, and it's wrong, turn and go in another direction, and it'll be right. <laughs> the pebbles in the road will all of a sudden become illuminated and beautiful when they're going the other direction. They're flat. It's a hard question to answer. You know, 
Well, Jay was, when I was at IG, Jay was stupid. Mm -hmm. And he asked the most appalling different questions. <laughs> you put me through the hoops. Did you realize that? And I was just starting to teach, but you really did. It was mutual, it's okay. He <laughs> <laughs> was marvelous. And he was a man and a great photographer. My God, the places he'd go to get these photographs. But you know what, you know. You find it, you, it becomes, you have to find it unless you really are stuck someplace you can't, you literally can't do it. That's why I always, when I'm out there stalking photographs, I always have the camera loaded. Mm -hmm. I always have a couple of backs loaded. I always have the lens that I know that I would use first on the camera and ready to go because there are times, like the picture of the train running across the, landscape with the open boxcar door. Well, I knew I wanted to get that travel. I get that was in Montana. And I drove for 25, 30 miles to get ahead of that train. So I could find a place where I could get out of the car and get out and get across the barbed wire fence and set up the tripod and wait for the train. Well, that's, and then luckily the light was perfect. Sun came out from behind the sky and the foreground. I mean, that's that's God's work is not mine. But it's one of those moments that if I hadn't had the camera ready, I would have missed it. If I had fumbled to get the camera loaded, I would have missed it. <coughs> Jay, he's always 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 asking other questions. <laughs> well. Um... I'd like to thank you very much uh, well, for being here tonight and I hope everyone will enjoy the, the book um, and the exhibition as well. Well, thank you for asking me.